Hey guys, welcome back to Northwest Small Batch Brewing. I'm Steven, and uh, this morning I want to talk about how to stop fermentation. Uh, there are times when you don't want your yeast to continue fermenting. Maybe you're doing a wine or a cider and you've got it dialed in to the flavor you want. You've got the back sweetening to where you want it and you don't want it to continue fermenting because then it will change the flavor and it will become more dry, that sort of thing, right? How do you do that? How do you make it shelf stable, right? How can you leave it sitting outside the refrigerator and not keep fermenting. So that's the question of the day. Stick around and we'll get to it. All right, so I've got some notes in front of me because uh, honestly, I don't really do this much anymore. Um, now that I'm primarily doing beer, I mean, I do throw some other stuff in there from time to time, but even when I do other things, I don't usually, um, I don't usually have to stop the fermentation. So the first thing is with beer, you really don't have to do this because you're not ever going to really back sweeten a beer and then try to stop the fermentation. Um, beer naturally has some non-fermentable sugars. It's going to vary from beer to beer, which gives you a slight sweetness depending on the beer that will stay exactly where it needs to be, even when it's not, you know, refrigerated. That being said, if you're not giving beer away, and you have the space in a, in a refrigerator, uh, you can put your, your wine or your cider into a refrigerator and it won't stop the fermentation, but it will slow it down to the point where it's basically dormant. Um, case in point, I have five gallons, well, I've been drinking a little bit of it, so a little less than five gallons of um, hard apple cider that's in my keg and that's kept refrigerated and it's back sweetened but because it's refrigerated in a you know cold refrigerator it doesn't need to be halted because the yeast has gone dormant because it's so cold in the uh, refrigerator so all that back sweetening it's it doesn't ferment because the uh, I mean it, you know it's possible if it warmed up a little bit it could start to ferment a little bit but um, I don't intend for, for it to stick around for too very long. Um, so let's talk about how you can stop your fermentation. Like if you're making a wine, you might want to do this if it's gone dry and you want to back sweeten it a little bit, but you don't want it to start fermenting again. What do you do, right? Same thing with cider. Uh, I always back sweeten my cider because um, dry cider to me is just not, a, it's not something I enjoy. Um, so if I'm going to make cider, I have to back sweeten it. Uh, and then of course you have to decide, you know, well, how do I keep it from re-fermenting? So the first option and one that gets a lot of, uh, negativity online in YouTube is chemically stopping your fermentation. First thing I will say about this, uh, I don't want to get into a big, you know, argument with people, but I mean, a lot of commercially made stuff is both filtered and chemically stopped. So you're already drinking, you know, if you're drinking commercially made stuff, chances are it's got chemicals that stop the fermentation in it already. So, you know, not every brewery does that. Uh, and I think more and more craft breweries do not do that. Uh, but it is a thing and it happens. And, you know, if you think you're not drinking stuff that that's, had it chemically stopped, yeah, you're probably mistaken. Uh, that being said, I'll move on from that because that's kind of a negative, you know, then I don't really do a uh, chemical, I don't chemically ever stop, I don't ever chemically stop a fermentation uh, at home myself. I'm just saying 
from a personal point of view, I, it, it doesn't really bother me too much. Uh, so the way you would do it, and again, I'm just giving you this information based on what I have seen and read. I've never really done it this way, but you can buy something called Campton tablets. I might even have some Campton tablets. I'm not sure. Um, usually homebrew stores or Amazon, right, or online. Campton, C-A-M-P-D-E-N. I just want to spell it out because that is a weird sounding word. Um, they're just these little tablets that um, they do a couple of things. M most people use it for is if you have tap water. You know, for me, I brew with um, store-bought spring water, uh, but I only brew like once a month. So it's not too big a deal for me to do that. However, if you're brewing more often or you're brewing larger quantities, it will be difficult or expensive to always be buying spring water at the store. So you're going to probably use your tap water. Uh, and, and then that's a whole other discussion. Do you want to get a water, you know, uh, read out on what, what, what um, you know, what's in your water and if you make, need to make any changes to it and stuff. I did a video on that. I don't know if I posted it yet. If I did, I'll try to put a link. If I didn't, uh, it'll come out sometime um, in, in regards to water, you know, and, and your beer. Um, Campton tablets will remove chlorine. Um, I'm trying to think, um, I don't recall how, I don't really use them since I use the spring water. I'm trying to think of how long it takes. Um, yeah, the video I made on it, I did talk about that. I looked that up, but... Um, I'm not sure if it's overnight or if it's just like, you know, an hour or two. Um, but I understand that you can actually smell the chlorine literally coming off the water when you put the, the Campton tablets in. And I think like one tablet is good for like, I don't know, I want to say like 30 gallons or something. So chances are you don't need to use a full tablet. You could probably use a half tablet, whatever it says on the box, whatever the directions say, uh, how much you need to use. So that's the first thing, right? Um, that's not alone, that alone is not going to stop the fermentation. That's just the, one half of the, um, and listen, a lot of people use Campton tablets in their brewing. So if you're, again, saying, I don't want to do chemically, I don't want to chemically stop my fermentation. Well, a lot of people are using Campton tablets, not even to stop fermentation. They just use it to remove the chlorine. So it's still in there. It's being used. And, uh, you know. It is what it is. Uh, then you also need to add a second chemical called potassium sorbate. Again, you can buy this online. You can buy it at homebrew stores. It doesn't take much. Uh, follow the directions. But what I found is that for every gallon of beer, you add half a teaspoon of potassium sorbate. Um, it's probably best to mix that with some hot water, like to dissolve it first <clears throat> and then let that cool a little bit, of course, and then pour that into your, your um, liquid. So using um, the potassium sorbate and the Campton tablet together should halt fermentation. I say should because there's never a guarantee. <clears throat> there's never a guarantee. Um, a lot of breweries uh, or wineries will actually filter their wine and, and cider and whatnot as well. Uh, to get yeast out and, and try to, again, make it as shelf-stable as possible. Um, so this works for non-carbonated stuff. I'm not sure, <clears throat> I mean, because once you bottle condition to carbonate, <clears throat> you really can't put this chemical stuff in there to stop the fermentation. So I guess what you could, yeah, I mean, you could still back sweeten, but you're not gonna be able to carbonate it naturally because the yeast will be dead at that point. Uh, you'd have to force carbonate if you wanted to do that. So chemically stopping fermentation and you know, comment below if I'm mistaken, but the only way I can see it working is if you're having a still beverage, right? A non-carbonated wine or cider or whatever. <clears throat> if you want it carbonated, that's not gonna work very well for you. Um, so, Let's go over some important notes in regards to the second method for stopping fermentation. Uh, and that's through heat, right? 
we already know that yeast are very sensitive to heat, whether it's during fermentation or um, in this case, what, what temperature does yeast die? Well, yeast start to die at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I said start to die. <clears throat> they don't actually die completely. They are fully dead at 140 degrees. Now, the question is, how long? right? So if you bring your beverage up to 140 degrees, how long do you have to leave it at 140 degrees to ensure all the yeast are dead? That's the question. And honestly, there's no good answer. I hear um, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. So I'm hearing anything between 10 and 20 minutes, basically. And uh, nobody seems to have, like, the answer. Um, but, um, yeah, so uh, you can heat water on the stove in a pot. Uh, I know at least one brewer that uses a sous vide. You know those systems where you hermetically seal your food in a bag and do you suck out the air? I don't know, but then you just throw it in a, uh, a water bath that has a little machine that keeps the temperature of the water at a very specific temperature. So you could use a sous vide if it... If those go to 140, I, I don't know much about them. I've never done that kind of cooking. Um, so I have two methods. I have an old method that what I used to do and a new method. Um, some of it overlaps a little bit. So for example, you've got your bottle. So, so let me set this up for you. You've got your cider or your wine or whatever it is. It's already been back sweetened to the, the flavor that you like. You've uh, capped it and you've let it carbonate for a couple of days. And so the carbonation level is where you want it. The sweetness level is where you want it. Now you want to stop fermentation so it stays that way, even if it's unrefrigerated. That's where we're at. So we're using glass bottles. As you can imagine, you're taking a glass bottle that has pressurized liquid and you're putting it in a hot water bath. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? So, we want to minimize the chances of something going wrong. I can tell you, spoil alert, there's only been like one or maybe two times I've tried this where I didn't have bottles explode. Uh, they didn't, I've never had all the bottles explode, but um, yeah, it happens. And I've seen it happen uh, to other YouTubers who have done videos on this. So I think all you can really do is try to minimize the damage. Basically, you want to warm up the bottles a little bit before you do the water bath. So fill your sink up with warm water and let the bottle sit in the warm water in the sink for like 10 minutes. Drain it and then do it again. So basically you're trying to slowly heat up the liquid inside the bottles and not be quite too drastic so that when you put the bottles into the hot water, it's not going to shock them, hopefully. Um, so you're going to slowly warm up the bottles in the sink with hot water. In the meantime, you need to know how much water to put in, the, in your pan that's on the stove. So you need a pan that's deep enough so that you can fill up the water and it, the water comes at least to the neck line of where your, your beer is because the yeast is throughout the entire liquid in that bottle. So the water has to cover that entire amount that's in the bottle. So what I like to do is put all the bottles in the empty, in the empty you know, pot, then fill it up with water so you know how much water you need then take the bottles out and start warming them up in the sink a little bit. And while you're doing that, you can start heating your water that's in the pot. It also helps to have a pot that has a lid. Some people like to use pressure cookers because they, you know, if, if there is something bad that happens, you know, it'll be contained and it won't shoot out everywhere and make a mess. I've heard of, you know, people's kitchens becoming, you know, disaster areas where <laughs> their, their brew has exploded everywhere. Um, so you start heating up the water. I always have one bottle that's filled with water, a glass like beer bottle or whatever, but doesn't have a lid on it. Because what you're going to do is put a thermometer on it and stick that in with all the other bottles. And now you can actually track how hot is the liquid inside your bottle getting because you have a tester with a thermometer. So you heat your water. The water has to be hotter than 140 degrees. Does this make sense? If I put it to 140 and then stick the bottles in, just like your mash and a strike temperature, it's going to drop. 
and then it won't be warm enough to kill the yeast. So a lot of folks have done this before me and have come up with the proper temperature. You need to heat your water up to 170 uh, to 180 degrees. It's pretty warm, right? It's not quite boiling, but it's pretty warm. That's um, 76 and a half to 82 degrees Celsius, in case you're wondering. Uh, so you heat your water up to that temperature, turn off the heat. This is like the number one, don't leave the heat on. Uh, if you leave the heat on, your bottles will explode because you're heating from the bottom and it's, yeah, turn the heat off when, it's, when it hits the right temperature. Place the bottles one at a time. I like to use tongs, like, um, you know, kitchen tongs, so that I'm like at least a little bit distant because you don't want your hand on the bottle when you put it in, if it does explode. You don't want to be right around that glass. So I use tongs and gently put each bottle in, including the tester bottle with a thermometer, and then cover it, if you can, with a, a lid of some sort. And now you're going to watch. You're going to watch the temperature of that tester bottle. When it hits 140 degrees, you know that your yeast is starting to die. Now, how long do you keep it at 140 degrees? I'm going to say 20 minutes. That's the longest amount of time I've seen anybody say to do it, which means that hopefully that's long enough. Hopefully it will stay at 140 degrees for that long. Um, if it doesn't, it doesn't. But anyway, when it's done, after that 20 minutes or the temperature drops below 140, pull out your bottles gently using the tongs. Set them on like a soft towel as gently as you can at room temperature and just walk away. <laughs> Once they're out of the pot and sitting on the counter and resting, uh, I've never had one explode. So let them come down to room temperature and you should be good to go. They should be pasteurized at that point. Um, again, it's not a guarantee. You don't know for sure if all the yeast died or not. You're just doing the best you can. Um, and at that point, they should be shelf stable. You don't have to refrigerate them. You're good to go. If you don't have to do this, like unless you're giving bottles away to somebody or something, if you don't have to do this, um, you know, most commonly I think it's done with carbonated ciders that can't be refrigerated for whatever reason. Um, but unless you have like a carbonated wine, like a sparkling wine, I could see doing it with that as well. But otherwise, um, yeah, if you can avoid doing it, like, like I said with a cider that I have in my keg right now, um, it's just a, it's a huge hassle. So... That's how you do it if you want to do it. I'll put like a step-by-step -step direction in the, in the uh, description so that you don't have to like write it down as you're watching this video. And uh, as always, like, subscribe. Thanks for watching the video. And uh, good luck with your upcoming brews. Happy brewing.